Hey, fun fans. We're getting close to reaching 1 million views on YouTube, and to help us celebrate 254, the Cheesy Poos has provided us an awesome t-shirt to give away. All you have to do to be entered is to be a YouTube subscriber and let us know in the comments which team you're from. You can enter once in every YouTube video uploaded through the month of September, so make sure you comment below. Let's jump right in, kind of talk about the elephant in the room. Um, this past weekend, the Skystone kickoff happened, which was really exciting. And I know for me personally, um, I watched the game video and was definitely less of a fan of it for the first like hour. And then things started sinking in. I was like, yeah, this seems like a really neat game. So jumping into kind of just talking about autonomous, um, you have a few different ways you can actually score points. Um, Moving stones into the building zone seems like a fairly big one. Um, you can move your foundation into the building site and just drive onto the sky bridge. Um, and a big one is you can continue running those cycles and s place both sky stones and standard stones. Yeah, Ethan, I remember like in uh, Relic Recovery, teams like Gluten Free or Crack and Pinion, they were doing like six cycles of the glyphs. I wonder how teams of this, this caliber will be performing uh, with the stones and sky stones this year. It will be interesting because you have a like fairly limited amount of stones you can score, and it requires a lot of driving. So yeah. it may require some interesting um, autonomous routines we haven't seen before. And the other thing is your foundation can move. So generally, aside from maybe Velocity Vortex, we haven't seen where that like scoring zone moves throughout the match. And that seems yep. hard to predict in Autonomous, especially. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think that this is going to be very, very interesting to see the Autonomous not having this, the hard cap. But I think that the different uh, a difference in this year's game versus previous year's games is that in previous years, it was very clear how to maximize or continue to maximize your Autonomous scoring. This year, it seems like it's going to be quite a bit harder. It's going to be much more um, uh, nuanced um, to... Um, uh, to to be able to succeed in these uh, complex autonomous tasks. Uh, Danny, do you, do you have any thoughts on the autonomous period of this game? Yeah, I think it's really exciting. Um, I think the you guys talked about some of the, the six cycle you know robots that we've seen in the past. Um, you know, one of the cool things about those robots is they didn't really have to move all that far. They were just kind of shuttling back and forth. Whereas with Skystone, you know, if you want to do you know kind of there or thereabouts, you really got to put your your mileage on on that robot and really get you know a whole lot of travel going on. Um, one of the other, you know, kind of interesting tidbits about the, the game animation video, one of our first looks at Skystone is most of the time you only ever see one robot, uh, on camera, you know, especially in like some of those autonomous tasks or whatever, um, mm -hmm. You know, and so the field is going to get really congested, um, you know, for a lot of those sort of thoroughfares. So planning your autonomous mode with your partners, um, you know, and being able to kind of, you know, say you guys do this and I'll do that or you go first, I'll go second. You know, that's going to be a big part of, you know, what it takes to kind of go from a good autonomous mode to a great autonomous mode. Absolutely. One of the things that I'm really excited to see is you kind of it seems like you'll have this big shift between running autonomous cycles and scoring glyphs, or sorry, scoring stones there, and scoring stones in Teleop, where all of a sudden you're going from really crossing a shorter distance to all of a sudden you have to go to the other side of the field and you're crossing the path of potentially three other robots that are also trying to go, and they kind of all meet in the middle, which I think will be really interesting. And you have similar scoring objectives that really shift quick throughout the match periods. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, that's the, that's where we start with autonomous. But as we move to Teleop, there are a, a, a bunch of other uh, scoring elements that take place. Um, in Teleop, teams are able to score their points by building their skyscrapers as high as possible. Teams get a point for every stone they take across their alliance-specific sky bridge. So every stone they take under their sky bridge. And a point per stone placed on their foundation. In addition, uh, each team gets a skyscraper bonus based on the level of their tallest skyscraper. So the taller skyscraper skyscrapers can rack up points real real quick mm -hmm. and i think like with this it's going to be really important seeing like how teams decide to balance uh like stability versus just absolute height absolutely yeah i think that it's very this year's game is very very unique because of the way that you can't really tell what what's going to happen 
because in previous years I've always felt that there was there was a, there was a there was a way to play the game, right? There was um like you you had a very very sele- uh, you had a very very set objective. But this time it's mm-hmm. a lot more open-ended. I think that's going to be really really fun to watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like with that I remember like coming into Relic Recovery and uh, Rover Ruckus, I never like thought like, oh, maybe one team will just like uh collect this uh minerals and the other team will actually score them or like maybe one team will collect the glyphs and the other team will score them. But like in this it's like genuinely strategy I've been like considering like will teams be doing just moving the stones across the bridges uh and then teams just scoring. Like that genuinely might be viable this year in which uh, previous years it hasn't really been like uh, something I've really uh, seen could succeed. Uh, Danny, sure. you have anything to add on to things? Yeah, I think the the teamwork aspect of this game is one of the things that I find really, really exciting. Um, having, you know, th- there are two very different optimizations for, you know, what a good o- alliance needs on on their side to to play this game and score a ton of points so you're right uh the task of moving bricks from the loading zone over to uh near your foundation takes one style of robot right you want to be pretty small you want to be under that 14 inches you want to go really fast you want to maybe kind of zigzag and zoom around you know anybody else who might be in your way so you're always moving always making progress towards you know that foundation or back again and then your your stacking robot, you know, maybe they're not going for total height, but they're going for, you know, just getting lots of bricks, you know, onto that foundation in a good way. You know, that takes, you know, sort of slow control precision. Um, you know, that's a really different, you know, maybe not robot, but that's some really different mechanisms. Um, and so being able to have, you know, uh, one robot on your side that's, you know, optimized to go really quick and one robot, you know, that's doing the stacking um, means those two robots can work together. I would say possibly better than two robots that are trying to each do the full cycle, um, but mm-hmm. maybe aren't themselves quite so good at it. So being able to have that combo pair um, could be really, really exciting. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that yeah. Hasn't, yeah, exactly like a boss hit on earlier. That hasn't been something that really has made sense in the past. Um, mm-hmm. You had some, a couple teams like, both doing a single cipher, but that really didn't happen at very high levels of play. And I think it has the potential to this game this year, which is really interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that, Oh, uh, I think that the, 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 this year's game has really hit the nail on the head that FRC has been doing so often, which is that you have different bots that do different things. Um, I think that's never happened in FTC, but this year really has that potential. Sorry. What were you saying of us? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you covered it perfectly, but I think we should move on to Endgame now. And, like, Endgame, I think, is interesting this year because with the teams placing their capstones, uh, you really have to make a decision, and as well as removing the foundation. It's, like, deciding, like, is this foundation, like, uh, like stable enough to be moved, right? Because, like... Uh, if you're, unless your foundation is 15 levels high, it's very risky to move it. And uh, I just think that's, like, very, it's going to require, like, a lot of thinking on the driver's side, like, right in the heat of the moment uh, in the match field, and that's something teams should really be prepared for. Absolutely. I think that, that you actually hit that on the head because it's, mm-hmm. it's such a huge cost-benefit analysis that I believe teams are going to mm-hmm. have to do now. Um, it's never been that case, right? Like, with the capstone thing, yeah, sure, we've had something similar with the um, with the Velocity Vortex cap ball, where once you place right. it, you can't score anymore. But, like, mm-hmm. thinking about whether you should do like whether you should uh, achieve a scoring objective with the with sort of the potential to lose everything you've worked for the entire match that's something that i think is just insane Mm -hmm. it is for sure one of the really interesting things that kind of reminds me a lot of frc is there are a lot of lanes of travel that cross i think this year which Mm -hmm. like is again kind of leads itself to two vastly different kinds of robots like if i was building a robot for this game I feel like I'm deciding between your really, really fast Mechanum robot that's like 16 to 1 and it just wants to get around everyone. And on the flip side, maybe you build a 42-pound six-wheel drive and you just keep driving and you're the robot that other people have to watch out for. So it's a really interesting kind of, I'm not sure which way a lot of teams will go. And it may be where if your field's full of really fast Mechanum robots, you, sh- you want to be that six-wheel drive, or it may be the other way around. 
<laughs> Absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. Like, that's something that is, again, just like very, very, it, you don't, you don't see it uh, when at, at surface level, but it, it's nuanced. And I think that's really cool. Danny, what are your thoughts? I, well, I'm a big fan of six wheel drive kind of, you know, out and out. So I think that that rabbit robot could do wonderful mm-hmm. things as a six wheel drive robot. Um, now, Mechanum robots also have, you know, their role to play in this. They have sort of a different optimization, um, but there, you know, you can do some really cool stuff with that too. Um, I think, you know, it, it's, there's, there's also, you know, that uh, a Mechanum robot geared down. So it has a lot of control, a lot of finesse, you know, you may be able to use that and do a lot with your drivetrain and have a really simple, really straightforward sort of elevator arm claw, you know, sort of situation, um, where your claw doesn't sort of slide back and forth or in and out, you know, in order to get that perfect placement, but you're doing that with your drive base. So a lot of, a lot of really cool, you know, different things. And one thing that I kind of hope to see is, you know, that teams can kind of, build their way through the season. So, you know, if you get to your first tournament and all you are is, um, you know, like a drive base that can kind of maybe not, it doesn't even grab a, you know, stone. It just, you know, holds onto it and pushes it, uh, you know, and then you get to your second competition, your second league meet, you know, you're doing that a little bit faster. You get to your third league meet, you know, maybe you're going into a league championship and you're saying, Hey, that's a cool design over there. I can use that for some of my, my lift mechanism. Um, you know, and eventually get on to, to, you know, state championship or region championship or, a, you know, world championship. Um, and now I'm starting to put all those pieces together. So the, the challenge can grow with, you know, your, your team's development all the way through the competition season and really present new and unique things all the way through. And you don't have to have that s- star player, stellar robot from day one. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I- I think uh, one thing like uh, one thing I really uh, agree with you, Danny, about that is like uh, last year, I think it was like kind of difficult for uh, rookie teams to do especially well. Right. Because like uh, going in the crater and like doing all this uh, motion vertically and horizontal, it's it's uh, difficult for a new team. And especially with hanging like that's a completely different challenge. Many teams haven't seen like this year with a simple push spot, you can get like a couple points in order to help your alliance to score. And I think that'll really uh help rookie teams and, you know, like boost their performance in the game. Well, I, I think it's, it's not just that, you know, a, a rookie mm-hmm. team or, or a low resource team or a team that just has a drive base. It's mm-hmm. not only that they can score a couple points, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It's that if they do a good job delivering bricks to their partner yeah. who is stacking them, then yeah. you can't really disassociate those points from one robot or the other. That yeah. alliance made that mm-hmm. tower, that alliance you know, put those points up on the board. So it's not even that, you know, a little push bot is scoring a couple mm-hmm. points. That little push bot is contributing. They are a part of the Alliance. This is a two robot tag team, right? So mm-hmm. that's one of the things I think is, is new and it's different in this uh, FTC game. Whereas a lot of times, you know, there have been stuff for, for a drive based robot to do, but now we have a combo pair. We have a, t- a tag team, you know, partnership that's going to go um, on to do great and wonderful things more than just what one robot can do, you know, by themselves or even two good robots can do independently without, you know, paying attention to one another. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. That's a great point. So um, in terms of this, so we've covered what the scoring elements are. So now I sort of want, I, I know we've been talking about like our initial thoughts, but like, what do you guys, what do you guys truly think about each of these elements of this game? Like what, wh- what are some, what are some initial thoughts, but like, what are some, uh, what, what are some of the things that you saw after taking a more nuanced look at this? I uh, I've kind right. of covered the big ones that I really like. Auto sounds mm-hmm. so cool, and there are so many aspects um, that are all interesting ways to score points. Um, mm-hmm. That are and are a lot kind of force you to approach autonomous that seems very different from the traditional FTC mindset. Um, I am a really big fan of the potential for defense in Teleop too. That seems awesome. Right. I know this isn't like exactly like scoring elements, but like just like scoring in the game. I think uh, the use of the pictographs and like the Vuforium all feels pretty useful this year because like over the summer we saw a huge push with like a lot of teams uh, uh, 
talking about odometry, right? And like so many videos like on like how to program odometry, like why odometry is useful and all of this stuff. And like this year, while odometry is definitely viable, even using like the uh, VU marks around the field to get around, I think could be a choice because like now you have eight all over the field and then four on the neutral sky bridge as well. And I think that could be helpful. That's a very interesting take. Yeah, I, I see where you're coming from on that. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. the, the, there is a lot of potential there. You, you are right. Um, I think that personally, I think that like the auto, it's it's much more unique or, or I think it would I, I would say that it's much more like uh, classic per se. Um, it does have some very, very interesting elements with like with having uh, being being able to score so much. Um, mm -hmm. But in the same t at the same time, that scoring is really, really um, made difficult by the by, by the field itself. And I think yeah. that that sort of combination will challenge teams more than other autonomous challenges have been in the past. Because in the past, it's really been like take last year for example. It's there's not been that much challenge in terms of getting from point A to point B. It's just been drive there, drive back, and then just start shuttling those uh, shuttling those cubes in, right, and balls and stuff. But this mm -hmm. year, it's going to be a logistics challenge, and I think that's very, very unique and interesting. Danny. I think one of the the nifty things about the the auto task um, is that it's it's sequence dependent, right? If you look mm -hmm. back to um, uh, relic, yeah, relic recovery, um, the, the game task was just sort of the, the the auto task was find the thing, find the right column, and put as many glyphs into the crypto box as you could. Um, mm -hmm. And in 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 this game, you've got to go do that task where you identify the sky stones, and you've got to do that first. And if you go, if, if you drive and you and your partner bump into each other and things go all sorts of haywire, you can screw that up for yourself. Um, and so I think you know teams are going to have to be careful and they're going to have to plan out how they go about doing it because it is so sequence dependent. So I think that's kind of a, a really nifty kind of take on on the auto uh, gameplay. Yeah, definitely. And uh, one thing we like completely didn't talk about yet is the human element, like human player oh, yeah. element. What do you guys think about that? So for me, at least personally, I mm -hmm. think that the human element has pros and cons. Um, mm -hmm. I think that when we start uh, to, to start about the um, like the pros, it's that it the human player can reach into the field and place this game element exactly where it needs to be. Right. Right. It's not mm -hmm. like FRC where in like 2016 with uh, the um, castles, I forget the name of the, uh, I forget the name of that game, but like you had to roll those balls in. You had to make sure that it goes in the right place and teams like 195, like the cyber Knights, they would practice, right? Like rolling those to the exact place you could get it. That's what high level teams required. And like la and last year, for example, or, or like 2015, the um, recycle rush year, like you mm -hmm. didn't know whether your crate was going to fall flat or was it going to fall like upside down and then you got like you, you messed up a cycle but with this game you place the block or you place the sky stone exactly where you need it to be and i think that teams can really capitalize on that and have a very well-trained human player that'll be able to minimize minim, minim, mit, mitigate sorry my bad i uh, tongue-tied but uh yeah minimize the amount of time that teams spend in that area of the field it is interesting yeah. because it I think it'll be very interesting to see a lot of those teams, like, all of a sudden, you're not even just working with members of your own team, um, because you have to explain to your alliance partner, okay, we really like our stones to be in exactly this orientation at this point in the match, and this is when we're going to go for another cycle and stuff like that. It could be very interesting. Yeah. Danny? I th like. I think of this from, like, a really significant, like, field mapping and field logistics standpoint if we were going to try to somehow relic recovery uh 56 something stones onto the field it would have been kind of a nightmare so by bringing in the uh the human players it frees up a lot of real estate on the field lets robots kind of drive around um be able to mm -hmm. to you know really kind of maneuver um and and now you're using that human player to introduce them you know one at a time so i don't know where the the human player aspect of ftc is going to go but way 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 back in the day on frc you had stuff um where teams were directly 
quickly loading, you know, their robot. Um, back when 15 years ago, when Andy Mark started, you know, one of the, the, the human player roles was to run out, you know, onto the field and either like set something up quick before the match or, or direct load a robot. Um, so, uh, you know, it, FTC robots, a lot less dangerous than, than the big FRC machines. So they, you know, you can have people sort of interacting with them a little bit more, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and we still don't want, you know, people kind of touching the robots even, you know, in, in, in this game. So there are some rules around that. Um, but I, I think it, it just allows for a lot more things to be potential in the game design process if we don't have to have all of the stuff there on the field. So again, I don't know where it's going to go in the future. Um, it may stay, it may come back it may be off and on all of those different things could happen. Um, you know, but it, it's just, it's another sort of arrow in the quiver of different opportunities for, for things that the game design committee gets to play with. Hey Danny, one of the things yeah. I, I want to jump in and say, um, just coming from the FRC background is I think one of the great things about having a human player is that's another opportunity for somebody to be down in the field and get to experience that, uh, as well too. You know, I, when I, when I was in high school, you know, way back in early two thousands, I know old sort of thing. Uh, but I mean, I was a human player twice before I became the driver of my team and what a great way to get that experience to step up and and know what that's like you know it's it seems weird because it's 20 feet away from where you sit sometimes right but that that <laughs> mm-hmm. difference between that can make such a huge difference to be uh in, engrossed in what the experience is because for those of you who have been drivers and operators and down in the field you know that the second the mat starts you go tunnel visioned and you're not paying attention yep. to anything else down there and that's the cool mm-hmm. part i think about bringing somebody else down in the field yeah absolutely yeah, absolutely. That's a really unique uh, point of view, Tyler. I never thought of that before. Um, so even though the game was only released about five days ago, let's check out a few cool robots that teams have thrown together so far. Uh, the first robot we'll see was released on Reddit. And Tyler? While, while he's, while he's yeah. working on that, just a, a few things. Uh, like one thing that I think is important to think about when we're talking mm-hmm. about the uh, human player element is that the station is on the entire opposite side of the field. And there's right. a very, very significant choke point. So teams, while it's very beneficial because like it's great for teams to be able to pick up for an, uh, a block placed so precisely, they really will need to figure out how to get that far. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think... Uh, yeah, I'm going to kind of jump in this one. Uh, one of the features that I loved about this robot in three days um, was their claw can rotate 90 degrees. And yeah. it allows you to kind of like alternate your stack really well without necessarily driving on to the other side of the foundation. Um, that seems really cool. One of the things that I k- keep wondering about is like, I feel like somebody's going to drive their claw as field centric and drive the robot as robot centric and just have like this <laughs> claw that's already always angled 90 degrees from the foundation. Mm-hmm. That'd be cool. That'd that be would be really awesome cool to see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing I love I think... about, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Sure. I think that the the one thing I really love about this robot in particular was their intake. Um, that's something yeah. that I saw, and that's something that was like mm-hmm. that just brought me back to Relic Recovery. The um mm-hmm. the spring loaded um compliant yeah. wheels, basically, right? And yeah. honestly, like it makes sense, right? Because this game element isn't like mm-hmm. previous elements where you could just scoop them up and then orientation doesn't matter. Orientation does matter. It matters so much in this game that like by using this, by like having something that can pick up a block in any orientation and bring it right back to exactly where it needs to be is super important. Yeah. And, uh, I know Andy Mark re- just released some new uh, compliant wheels. So maybe we'll see how, we'll see how those work out. And uh, oh, one thing I think, Sorry? Oh, I said absolutely, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, one thing I think would be interesting to see is uh, how teams actually do their scoring, right? Like, I think uh, a meta will be uh, established pretty immediately for uh, intaking and, like, picking up the stones, but perhaps not for scoring, in my opinion, because there's so many designs of, like, linear extensions out there. And, like, even last year, like, with Roper Ruckus, we didn't really see only one design of robot completely dominating the game. Absolutely. Yeah, so now we're going to move on to the next robot reveal that we've seen. It's the uh, classic robot in 30 hours coming from those alumni of uh, 7129, I want to say. I don't remember exactly yeah. what team. But, Robo Raiders. Yep, Robo Raiders. So these alumni are great. They know how to they know how to build a robot. They do it every freaking year. It's great. Yeah, dude. It's insane. I, I really like their claw. You can see it a little bit there. It's mm-hmm. a very different um, approach to that challenge that I probably would not have thought of. Absolutely. And, 
you're not really grabbing the sides. You're kind of using some different leverage to your advantage, which is mm -hmm. really neat. And, and if you, you observe... Oh. No, no. Uh, yeah, so in addition to that... Uh, just if, if we just once again harping back on that intake thing, if we look at <laughs> if we look at this team's intake, it's very similar to teams like uh, 5220 of uh, the uh, I forget their name, but uh, like out of California in uh, Relic Recovery and teams that basically had a solid um, a, st a, a, a solid intake um, with those compliant wheels. So once again, it's just bringing it back to that design principle that was shown two years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think with this, like as Ethan was talking about their uh, claw for scoring, um, I think it's a really ingenious design because you're going to have to get over that foundation lip uh, no matter what. And just the way they do it, I think it provides a lot of versatility and efficiency. I was just um... – Oh, I had something there and it's gone. Um, no, I think the, oh, that's what it was. Um, I was wondering if anybody kind of uh, timed out that video that they had, that, that long run that they had at, at sped up, if somebody timed out how long that actually took in, in real time. I was kind of curious how long they, they took to score. I think it was about eight bricks. Um, but definitely a, a really sweet robot. You know, the the grabbing the stud, you know, means that you're free and clear. So if there's other bricks around, you know, you're you're not, you know, bouncing into other stuff. You can always go on top. So really kind of a nifty way to to go about doing that. Super super cool. And being a lightweight servo, not a big heavy DC motor, means that you know they limit the amount of weight out on the end of their arm, which means their arm is going to work better, and and they need less uh, logistics, less stuff. Uh, to move that arm uh, in and out and back and forth. So a really well-optimized design. And uh, what do you guys think of, like, uh, Robo Raiders containing the stone in their robot the whole time uh, versus uh, versus uh, 12834 Checkmates robot, like, having it in their robot but, like, dragging it against the ground? Like, do you guys have any thoughts on that? I think that being able to control the stone is, mm -hmm. is going to be very important. So I think that mm -hmm. that's more... Um, that's that's going to be a more dominant strategy, but we'll see. We'll see. Teams can do yeah. many things. Yeah. Hey, one of the things I just want to uh, mention real quick is that we know that some people sent us uh, other RE3D videos. Uh, we're not going to be able to get to all of them, uh, but definitely uh, post them in our Discord uh, to show them off. We'd love to uh, see mm -hmm. other people have that as well. Uh, of course, Fun uh, did actually host a uh, – uh, university Challenge with University of uh, Nevada, Reno, and Las Vegas. You can check those out on our YouTube page. Uh, the robots are a little more basic than what these are. These are pretty impressive uh, on here. But you can see how full matches are played on the field at youtube.com forward slash first updates now. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. You can also directly help support fun by visiting our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash first updates now or by subscribing at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers keeping fun loud, live, and independent.